Today on Straight Talk Africa, what's the meaning of freedom of expression? Is it a Western or a Euro-American concept with no practical value for Africa? Or is it a universal inalienable birthright for every human being, including the poor and voiceless? That discussion is coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Sheikha Sali, and today it's a discussion on the challenges of freedom of expression in Africa. Across Africa, young people are putting their respective governments and long-time leaders on notice. They are standing up to abuses of power and expressing their disapproval through process, but at what cost? My colleague Paul Rondijo has more on the story. In its annual report, a human rights watcher says a violent government crackdowns against dissent are shaped Africa's human rights landscape in 2018. Government leaders are often a bullied peaceful protesters of political opponents, human rights defenders, and civil society organizations, while suppressing the freedoms of citizens, and in some cases, killings. For example, in the wake of violent uh, protests uh, over massive uh, fuel price hikes uh, in Zimbabwe, the government uh, imposed uh, unlawful restrictions and bans on peaceful protests. The reports of serious human rights abuses, including beatings, abductions, torture, and the involvement of uh, ZANU-PF, uh, the ruling ZANU-PF party groups, uh, in beating up people in the high-density suburbs around Harare. Throughout the region, people were denied their right to peacefully protest through unlawful bans, use of excessive force, harassment, and arbitrary arrests. The right to freedom of assembly was the exception rather than the rule, as young people advocated for democratic values. Doug Ferry, a Zimbabwean rights activist, says that democracy cannot just be about the majority towards those who did not vote for the ruling party. In terms of democracy, what's important is, is, the, is the balance of power, the institutions. Do we have strong institutions? Uh, what can the elected officials get away with? If the executive does something blatantly bad, can the parliament hold them to account? and pull them up short. In Sudan, demonstrations are calling for President Omar al-Bashir to step down continue. The armed government protests faster erupted in mid-December over inflation and soaring food and fuel prices. Human Rights Watch says that the protection of democratic values, self-determination and freedoms are being challenged every day. If you're an autocrat, it's very convenient to violate human rights. It's the way you stay in power. It's the way you, you fill up your bank account. It's the way you pay off your cronies. So there are reasons why governments want to violate human rights. Attacks on freedom of speech are seemingly at an all-time high as democracy is continuously being challenged instead of being perfected. According to Vanda Feller-Brown, a senior fellow on foreign policy at Brookings Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based non-profit organization devoted to independent research and policy solutions. Uh, having an informed public requires freedom of media, freedom of, freedom of speech, um, but it also requires access to uh, media and assets. And it requires that people have the physical space to concentrate on something other than their survival. Banda uh, says uh, in some African countries uh, you have long-time leaders exploiting ambiguities in the law to extend their terms in office while simultaneously undermining the nation's constitution. Elections, regular elections, with defined time frames, whether it's four years or five years, are a crucial facet of a democracy. And I would say presidential term limits are a cru crucial facet of democracy. And it's something that's very much um, 
contested around the world, uh, so certainly throughout Africa. There has been a lot of movement to abolish the term limits and change constitutions. As some African administrations clamped down on dissenters, uh, they became more emboldened uh, to attack traditional media and social media too, including blocking the internet uh, and text messaging services. Paul Diho, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. Uh, joining us here in the studio are three distinguished guests. John Tamin, Director of Africa Programs at Freedom House. Tundu Lisu, Chadema Opposition Member of Parliament in the Tanzanian Parliament, of course. And Wilson Masirinji, the Tanzanian Ambassador to the United States. And last but not least, Robert Chagulanyi, also known as Bobby Wine, an opposition Ugandan member of parliament. He joins us live via Skype from the Ugandan capital of Kampala. Well, gentlemen, um, I regret to say, of course, that uh, there is no female on this show today. Uh, I would like to say, frankly, that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the four of you today on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, Shaka. You're most welcome. Uh, let, let me come to you immediately, John. Uh, um, I would like you to do us a favor and walk us through some basics, really just like politics 101. First of all, when we talk about uh, freedom of expression, really, what are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking about basic rights that are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, for individuals to express themselves without fear of any sort of punishment, without fear of any sort of reprisal. Uh, and that may be political expression or that may be other forms of expression as well. Uh, let me add to that, I think one of the growing areas of freedom of expression is online. Uh, and this is a concern globally uh, and a concern in many parts of Africa as well, uh, especially with governments trying to limit space online and we're seeing some internet and social media shutdowns literally as we speak. Uh, that's one particular growing area, but really when we're talking about freedom of expression, we're talking about across the board, be it political expression or uh, expression in terms of uh, how one lives his or her life or any other form of expression. Uh, and that's something that we at Freedom House pay close attention to when we are looking at countries and doing our annual evaluations of how countries perform in terms of both civil liberties and political rights. But John, when you're talking about uh, online, really, and to, we probably narrowing it to the elite, really, in Africa. No, I don't think so. I think there's plenty of data that shows that uh, increasingly large segments of the African population are online. Uh, now those populations are more concentrated in urban areas, uh, but online access is really spreading. And you look at some of the protests that are happening in several countries, look particularly at Zimbabwe right now, at Sudan right now, at Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, in recent months. Uh, all of those protests have mm. had a strong social uh, online factor to them, social media factor to them, all three of those countries have at various times shut down access to the internet in recognition of how important it is. That is true, but is it also, for example, uh, a coincidence uh, or should we be surprised that uh, those uprisings are in fact taking place in urban areas? They are to some extent, but not completely. You look at what's happening in Sudan right now. Those protests are happening outside of Khartoum. They're happening in urbanized areas, but in a dozen or more urbanized areas throughout the country, and that's different than some of the protests that have happened in, Car in Sudan over the years, which have been concentrated in Khartoum. Uh, I think in Zimbabwe as well, uh, these protests are happening fairly far and wide, and they're driven by a fundamental desire for better governance and a fundamental frustration with lack of service delivery, lack of transparency, corruption that people are seeing in their leadership. Now, when you talk about uh, freedom of expression, of course, uh, are we talking about, uh, for example, a freedom that is restricted or targeting uh, 
uh, for example, a specific geography, an ideology, uh, are we talking about races? What are we talking about here? Because there are some people who think that uh, we're basically talking about uh, the Western world, really. If the question is whether these freedoms are Western concepts, I do not believe that is true at all, and I think we have some other panelists here uh, who can offer some strong opinions on that. Uh, these are universal rights, and they are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other documents that many governments throughout the world have signed up for. Um, as to how individual countries seek to suppress these rights, it's hard to draw broad generalizations because so many of the countries we're talking about are so different. Mm. Uh, what I would say is that in countries where we are seeing these rights suppressed, there is a fundamental desire by the elite and those in power to maintain power and to stay in office. And so they use different tools at their disposal. They suppress various freedoms, including expression in different ways, applying to different groups with the basic goal of maintaining their power, in part because a lot of those governments know they're not popular. And they know that they have to use these tools to stay because they know if there's an honest tally at the ballot box, they're probably going to lose. Now, John, you said that uh, a while ago you told me uh, before we came on the air that uh, you do have some kind of report card. Right. So every year around this time, Freedom House puts out our Freedom in the World report. And this is where we look at every country in the world, including the United States, uh, and look at how they performed the previous year in a whole host of indicators that are all publicly available. Uh, categorized between political rights and civil liberties. And so we just put out our new report yesterday, in fact, mm -hmm. all available online and getting a good deal of discussion in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, the picture for Africa is, is a mixed one. There are some concerning countries, and I think we're going to talk about those. But I also do want to point out that there are some real uh, good stories coming out of the continent this last year, and two countries in particular, Ethiopia, uh, under the surprising leadership of Ahmed Abi, uh, has really done some important things, including just yesterday instituting new civil society legislation that is quite meaningful, uh, and also Angola, uh, which has undergone a very surprising turnaround these last couple years. Well, the new president uh, is obviously fighting corruption, and what have you? He's, he's fighting corruption, and he's fighting the vestiges of the yeah. previous regime that was in power for decades. Uh, and so both of those countries, Ethiopia and Angola, have seen significant increases in our annual ratings. What are some of the countries that uh, are not doing so well, uh, especially if you uh, factor in the fact that uh, we do have uh, uh, guests who represent uh, Tanzania and Uganda? Yes. Well, I think when we're talking about those countries, it's really best for me to defer to the guests who have such expertise in those countries. I'll just say that Tanzania and Uganda are concerns for us, and the broader East Africa region is a concern for us, because outside of Ethiopia, I don't see any country in East Africa making forward progress in terms of democracy and governance. And in fact, we see some significant regressions. And I think there's a real sort of spillover regional effect that goes on, whereby there's very little peer pressure in East Africa, and you can say Central Africa too, for leaders to perform better. Uh, and to live up to a certain standard. That is why the progress in Ethiopia is so important, because it's a large country, 100 million plus people. And so if they can flip the script a little bit in East Africa, and if the prime minister create, can create that kind of momentum, create that kind of peer pressure amongst leaders, I think that can have important positive spillover effects as well. Tell us a bit about uh, the methodology that you use in order to arrive at some of those uh, uh, conclusions, for example. So every year we go through a process whereby we have expert analysts who look at each country uh, and they follow a very specific methodology that we laid out, again a methodology that we make fully public. Uh, and throughout the year they are monitoring certain indicators on democracy, governance, and human rights. Uh, and then towards the end of the year, we get together and we look at what they come up with in terms of their ratings, and we do a very thorough scrub of what they are proposing, including an expert panel of people who have done this for a while, including Africans and others in the human rights and democracy community. Uh, and we go through that and we really vet what they've done uh, in order to reach the final outcome 
uh, which we then publish early in the year. When you talk about um, expert analysts, what sort of qualifications are we talking about here in order for someone to be considered an expert analyst? We really look for people who have deep experience both in the country uh, and who have deep understanding of democracy, governance, and human rights principles. Uh, many of the analysts who we have are nationals of their particular country or from the region nearby. Uh, we pull significantly from the academic community, people who spend a lot of their time on these particular countries. Uh, and then when we get the, together this advisory group that looks at all the data and really scrubs to make sure that everything is as it should be, uh, that's a mix of both Africans and others who have done this for Freedom House for a while who really know the methodology very well, but also have broad regional expertise too. Very interesting. Uh, Bobby, why are you there? No. Are you there? Are you listening? What about from your vantage point um, in Uganda? How are we doing when it comes to freedom of expression? Hello, Shaka. Are you there? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. I'm happy to be um, contributing to this very important discussion. Of course, um, the state of uh, freedom of expression in Uganda is deteriorating by the day um, because initially uh, there was a clampdown on formal communication where politicians and leaders could no longer be allowed to go into the masses and sensitize them. And having noticed the treasure that we had, the music as a form of communication, we've been using music to communicate important messages all through the years, like it has been done uh, in the past. However, of late, uh, the government of Uganda has launched an attack on the arts, uh, particularly uh, on the music industry. And this can be um, traced to myself ever since I started using music mainly to sensitize people about their rights and freedoms. It has been um, a big crackdown. What have they done so far uh, whenever you attempt to perform, for example? Well, as we speak now, all my music concerts have been outlawed and uh, my songs have been banned on radios. Um, the security forces make sure um, my music is not played on radio or TV. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the recent past, there were reports of the police uh, raiding bars that play my music. However, mm. this is not just on me as an artist, but having noticed the power and uh, effect of music and the arts, the government of Uganda has, mo has moved to regulate the arts to the ridiculous extent of an artist or a creative um, or any other creative thinker having to submit the lyrics of their unrecorded songs to the minister for the minister to decide whether those lyrics can be recorded or not. And indeed, the government is also proposing that the, an artist must seek permission from the government before they travel out of Uganda to perform. To the rest of the world, this is a ridiculous move. But indeed, uh, that's how the government of Uganda has always been trying to legitimize its repression. This is being uh, mooted while uh, at the same time um, it is being uh, outlaid on the people. For example, I cannot perform. And this is a move to see, the, uh, to see that the government can actually legitimize the oppression that is already ongoing. Um, I have been told uh, uh, by John here that uh, Freedom House, uh, when it came to Uganda, uh, that it decided uh, to move Uganda from the category of partly free to not free. Would that be an accurate reflection of where you are? Well, um, indeed, I agree with them because our country is not free. But again, I refuse to concede because I know, I am convinced, and in, indeed, many of the members of my generations believe that they were born free and they must live free. Now, I have uh, a question for you, uh, Bobby Wine, uh, from uh, a fellow Ugandan. 
by the name Akankunda Moses. Uh, yeah. And it says, now what will Bobby Wine talk about freedom of expression in Africa? He's one of those creating intimidation, blackmailing, insulting the sitting government leaders. Let him first condemn the acts of hooliganism in his camp, then he can talk about freedom in Africa. How do you react to that? Well, I would say um, if it's rule of law, if whatever I'm saying is breaking the law, I should be apprehended and prosecuted. But wherever there's no rule of law, um, the regime uses people to brand others that seek for their own freedom as hooligans or as trouble causers. Like it has always been said, nobody has ever changed the world without having to be branded a trouble causer. Every time we raise our voices, there's no justification or no reason that is given for our oppression other than being dismissed. Thank you very much. Uh, let me go to Brother Tundu Lisu. Would you mind, for example, if I referred to you as Ndugu Tundu Lisu? Because it seemed to me that at one time in Tanzania, everybody sure. from the president, Rais, uh, through the university dawn up to the peasant farmer, everybody was comfortable being referred to as Ndugu. Absolutely, Shaka. I've no, I have no problem with that. And as a matter of fact, uh, <coughs> I was honored many, many years ago uh, when uh, I hosted uh, a former Tanzanian president, Benjamin Mukapa. When I asked him if it was okay with him, if I could actually refer to him as Ndugu Raish, meaning brother president, he did not have any problems. And we enjoyed that sort of interaction for the rest of the hour. Now, what about the status of freedom, Ndugu Tundu Lisu? Because uh, you are probably here precisely because there was a problem with freedom of expression in Tanzania? The, the state of freedom of, of uh, expression in Tanzania has taken a dramatic turn for the worse in the past three years. Uh, we have had always, we have always had um, limitations, very serious limitations on fundamental rights and freedoms in Tanzania. Even though we got our Bill of Rights in 1984, after, after almost quarter century uh, of having a constitution that did not recognize human rights uh, during the first uh, two, uh, more than two decades of independence. But after 1984, uh, we got a Bill of Rights in our constitution but it contained very serious limitations on the exercise of various freedoms. Uh, uh, you know, for example? Uh, for example, uh, we are talking of freedom of expression. And our constitution is very clear that every person is entitled to freedom of expression. But hand in hand with that constitutional provision, we have always had laws that severely, which made uh, the, the right to free expression uh, uh, almost useless. For, for example, since 1953, we have had sedition provisions in our, our criminal statutes. Now, sedition is a classic offense against free speech. And the reason it was enacted in 1953 was the colonial state, colonial the British legal. colonial state, was getting ready legally, legislatively, to deal with the uh, nationalist movement that was then emerging. Mm -hmm. So it is, the, the year is very important. 1953 is one year before the nationalist movement, Tanu, was born. And uh, for those who may not know our history very well, the first convict 
of the sedition provisions in our statute was a person known as Julius Kambarage Nyerere, who was the president of Tanganyika African National, National Union, Union, and two other, other uh, persons. One is Rashid Bagdele, who was the editor of the, of the uh, a newspaper called Mwafrika, and another one was Robert Makange, who was an editor of a newspaper called Sauti Yatanu. So our first, the first people to be uh, convicted of sedition, of this offense against free speech, mm -hmm. Baba Wataifa, Mwalim Nyerere, and uh, those two persons I've just named. After independence, one would have expected that this colonial statute, which prohibited, which criminalized free speech, would go in the way of the colonial state into the dustbin of history. But it was retained. And it has been retained today, to date. So, as we speak, as we speak, a member of parliament like myself I'm first with eight criminal cases back home. And all of them have to do with the offenses of sedition, of saying things that the powers that be do not like. Very interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I've just given my, 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 my story. My story, but as we speak, the national chairman of my party, the largest opposition party in Tanzania, the leader of the official opposition in parliament, Honorable Freeman Bowe, and another MP, is in prison. Uh, charged with what? Charged with sedition. I see. With, with, say, with making statements in an, an electoral campaign meeting which are offensive of these sedition provisions in our law. We'll come to that yes. um, a little bit later. So, so, so my, the, what I wanted to say was we have seen a dramatic, a dramatic uh, 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 about time mm. for the worse in, in, uh, when we speak of freedom of expression in Tanzania. How do you react to that, uh, Ambassador Masiri Inji? Thank you, my brother, Shaka Sali. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting, inviting me to this uh, very important uh, straight talk Africa program. We would uh, like to which also I was point been, out. Which I've that. been following for quite some time, and I'm glad to meet you. Be my guest. Uh, we would like also, for example, and I would like to, to thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For getting out of your busy schedule in order to come here and participate in today's program. I will quickly react, thank you so much. I will quickly react to both uh, panelists here, statements. Starting with George, uh, I commend him for admitting that he knows very little about Tanzania. So he's relying on reports he has been receiving from experts whom they sent to Tanzania to collect information uh, using the methodology which uh, he divulged to you following the intervention you, you made. I'm grateful to you for raising that, because we always question the methodology used in research. Right. Uh, since he doesn't know about Tanzania, I'm glad to share with him about what we have been doing. And uh, my brother, uh, Tundurisu, the member of parliament, fell short of telling what is happening now. Uh, the freedom of expression in Tanzania is entrenched in the Constitution. And uh, we have legislation implementing that expression, th that freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. The Media Service Act of 1916, of which he participated in passing in Parliament, provides uh, adequately on how to use that freedom of expression without infringing upon others' rights, which is also very important. Because you cannot have freedom of expression that can go unchecked anywhere in the world. Mm. For America, 
I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to have uh, studied in America at George Washington University Law School more than almost 30 years ago. I learned about the history of the Seduction Act of 1798. That was repe repealed in 1920, December 13th, mm. more than 100 years. Writing, making a false statement against the Congress, against the president, was criminalized and it was harshly punishable. Not less than 10,000 US dollars fine and not more than 20 years jail sentence or both. That is America. Currently in Tanzania, we have the Cyber Crimes Act, we have the. And, and let me tell you one thing. Another example of freedom of exception is himself. My brother, Tutu He has been speaking in the country. The checks that has been put on him is to bring him before the courts of law. He's not a convict of any seduction, crime. But the, the laws are clear, and I cannot interfere on what the court will deal with his cases. But uh, since he left the hospital in, in, in Belgium, he has been uh, hosted by media houses, BBC, Doshiwela. Here in Washington, D.C., has spoken to a few non government organizations. Leveling abusive and false allegations against our president, mm. against our government, against his country, demonizing the country is, is, is as good as demonizing yourself. But and here he is, and here he is, he is expressing himself. So the danger of allowing unchecked freedom of expression right. is when people abuse that right of freedom of expression, hurting others. And so you cannot uh, leave people to hurt others when the Constitution grants rights to everyone, including public interest. When you are speaking, consider there are others who could be hurt by your speech. Consider, consider that if you tell lies about others and damage their reputation, their character, they got hurt. I'm afraid so they uh, have to react. I'm afraid, uh, Mr. Ambassador, time happens not to be our best ally. And I hope we will find some space in your beautiful Tanzanian heart to forgive me for that. Thank you. Thank you. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We will have more of a discussion in a moment. So please don't go away because we'll be right back with you. On Our Voices, we're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. A reminder that we appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live on Facebook, and you can also watch us live on your mobile phone. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, Nigeria's presidential election is set for February 16th, the nation's sixth since 1999 when the military relinquished power to a democratically elected civilian government. President Muhammad Buhari and top challenger Atiku Abubakar are both Fulani Muslims from northern Nigeria. A discussion on what's at stake on the next Straight Talk Africa. Africa. 
our guest, uh, John Tamin, Director of Africa Programs of Freedom House, Liti Tundu Lisu, Chadema Opposition Member of Parliament in Tanzania, Wilson Mashiringi, the Tanzania Ambassador to the United States, and Robert Chagulanyi, also known as Bobby Wine, who joins us live via Skype from the Ugandan capital, Kampala. I stand, of course, uh, corrected uh, Ambassador Masiri Inji. That is very close to my indigenous tongue. I would it's say Masiri Inji. Masiri Inji. In my particular case, the Runyankore Ruchiga, I would say Masiri Inji. In your particular case, Masiringi. Masiringi. Can I finish? Uh, I started collected here. Yeah. Uh, could you please uh, uh, quickly. begin from mm -hmm. where you stopped? Yes. Thank you for an opportunity again. I was uh, following up on the issue raised by my brother, Tundurisu, that the opposition leader is in, incarcerated in prison. It's not correct. It's a remand and he's a fellow lawyer. There is a difference between a prisoner and a remandee. And he has been sent into remand after allegedly, I will say allegedly because I, I'm not in the country, violating the bond. And but the question is, is he free, for example? He, he, I would say he's not convicted. He's not free, but he's in custody. Not because of lack of freedom of expression. It's because the court, which has constitutional powers to act, Constitutional right regarding has sent him to to, to, uh, to to remand after violating the bond conditions. Let me How, ask can you, you this, relate that to his violation of expression? Let me ask you this question, uh, Ambassador yes. Masiri Ingi. Yes, please. Thank you. Correct I hope that now. this time uh, this I have correct. gotten it correct. Yes, please. How do you respond, for example, to some critics who say that when it comes to Tanzania, an individual has no right to own an opinion that is different from that opinion of the ruling party or state. I have a quick answer to that. That is total force, total fabrication. Currently, the parliament is in session. The opposition is in parliament. The chief whip, unfortunately, is out because of the a, a tragic event, uh, with, uh, an heinous act which was committed on him and caused the harm on, body the harm on him. Otherwise, he was supposed to be in parliament as well. Today, by coincidence, is a low day. Our president, His Excellency Dr. John Pomer Joseph Magufuli, the commander in chief, was a, a guest of honor, invited by the chief justice. The speaker of the house was in attendance. Several uh, legal officers like myself and my brother Tunduris were in attendance. So, if there is no one behind the bar for violating even the uh, Media Services Act, mm -hmm. where we have uh, 260, 16 newspapers, 158 radios, TVs, there are 34 social media platforms licensed, 224, with the cyber crimes. Law. Nobody is behind the bar for violating any law that implements the freedom of expression right under the Constitution. And the regulation of freedom of expression is mandated by the Constitution. What's wrong with that? There is no violation of the Constitution. Nobody has been victimized. Whoever is, uh, is charged, our presumption is that he's innocent until he proved guilty. And he will be given a day in court to defend himself. My brother will be given a day in court to defend himself. But we cannot allow people to go unchecked, abuse people, make it false statements, make false accusations, including demonizing the head of state, demonizing the government. I'm here as the ambassador of the United Republic of Tanzania to defend and protect the dignity of the country. So my brother coming here and trying to demonize the government, right. demonize uh, the president, demonize the country, demonizing himself and demonizing me as well, it, 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 we cannot call that uh, the, the true uh, need of Africa, getting freedom of expression. That does not build the interests of Africa, nor build the interests of the country. 
That's why we are concerned if people raise the issues of freedom of expression without also acknowledging that there are also rights of others that need not to be infringed. How do you reconcile yeah. that position with the fact that your brother here, Tundu Lisu, was nearly assassinated in the compound of the Tanzanian capital, Dodoma, during daylight at lunchtime, and his driver was not even hit by a single bullet. And this is a place, for example, I ha he has said, and I have also uh, found out that uh, this is a place generally that is provided security 24 7, 24 hours a day. How do you explain that? I mean, how do you reconcile that type of freedom that you are talking about? You cannot, you cannot relate that directly without substantiated evidence with freedom of expression. My brother was attacked. We feel sorry for what happened to him. Our president expressed his dismay and condemned that act and he ordered the law enforce, enforcement organs to investigate and get to the bottom of the matter and apprehend those who committed that criminal act against our brother. Everybody sympathizes what happened to him. Investigation is ongoing. They are waiting for him to go back and make a statement which he is giving to the press and government organizations outside the country. They are waiting for the, the, the driver. The driver hasn't presented himself to give a statement. So can you be a judge in your own cause? Can you condemn anyone and convict anyone on that matter without listening to both sides? Tundu, I, I cannot you, uh, judge on that one, but... How do you respond to that? Uh, thank you very much. Maybe uh, there are a few things that need to be set straight here. Uh, I was attacked inside a government housing compound which, as you said correctly, is guarded by armed security 24 hours, seven days a week. And each apartment block inside that compound is guarded 24 hours, seven days a week. And on the day of the attack, during lunch break, in the midst of parliamentary sessions, gunmen followed me from parliament inside that compound there was no security whatsoever. All the security guards had been removed from the perimeter wall, from all the apartment blocks. So these gunmen had complete freedom of access into this heavily guarded government security, a uh, government building co uh, 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 compound. And they rained me with bullets and they left. And as we speak today, not a single bullet was fired at the driver, or at least went into the direction of the driver. Is it correct? Well, he, the, the truth is he was not hit at all. That is, that is the truth. I was hit 16 times. I have undergone 22 surgeries, and uh, I'm going Could that for another be luck, one. or could it be that uh, whoever uh, was attempting to shoot and kill you had a single target? Obviously, I was the target. But the most important question is who ordered the security to be removed from this government housing compound? Number one. Two, this government housing compound is secured by CCTV cameras. They were removed immediately after the, the, the attack. And there is no word to date about those CCTV cameras. They were removed by the police. That is number two. So no one knows what they show, because the, no one knows where they were taken to, because the police have never said a word about where they took the CCTV cameras from. Number three, there has never been, to my understanding, and I, I know this because I speak to people, I speak to people in the government as well, no one has been interviewed. My neighbors, I, I, wasn't, I lived in the same building with the Minister for, for, for Energy, Medad Kalemani, with uh, the Permanent Secretary and the Minister of Local Government, with the former Health Minister, Haji Mponda. 
Not a single one of my neighbors has been interviewed by the police. None of the people who took me to the hospital, my housemaid and the housemaid of the deputy speaker, I was, I, when I was shot, they also shot all the cars that were, uh, you know, in the, in the driveway. The, the tires were all flattened. So I was taken to hospital by the housemaid of the speaker and my, my housemaid as well. None of them has been interviewed. I was in Nairobi together with my driver for four months. And during those four months, the Tanzanian police force uh, made, uh, they sent a, report, a request to me through my, my brother, who is, uh, who is my lawyer as well, that they would like to come to Nairobi to inter interview me and my driver. And we said, please come. They never showed up. So, and of course, after I, I, w I was transferred to Belgium, now the excuse has become, uh, we are waiting for Mr. Lisu to return and the driver so that they can be interviewed. But, Mr. Shaka, with all due respect to my, my senior uh, brother here, a, a, a very senior lawyer in Tanzania, I, in Tanzania there is a law, it is called Mutual Assistance in Criminal Matters Act, which makes provisions for uh, uh, obtaining evidence or suspects who run out of the jurisdiction of the Tanzanian law enforcement agencies. So they, 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 there is a law which would have allowed Tanzanian law enforcement agencies to come to Nairobi to take evidence from me and my driver. They have not done so. The, the same law would have allowed them to send police officers to Belgium where I have been for the past one year. To date, they have not done so. They could have gone through uh, the international police, Interpol, because this was a, 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 a serious criminal attack. In fact, under our, our, our statutes, it's a, it's a terrorist act. I was shot for political reasons. It's terrorism. They could, have done, they've gone, they could have gone through the Interpol to interview me and my driver so far they have not done so. They could have sought the assistance of the Kenyan government or the Belgian government. We have an embassy in Dar uh, the Belgian government has an embassy in Dar es Salaam. The Kenyan government has an embassy in Dar es Salaam. They could have used the good offices of our diplomatic missions in Nairobi and in, in Brussels to have us interviewed. Nothing has happened. I see. And finally, just to finish, finally, According to the Tanzanian police force, there is no suspect. They do not suspect anyone. No one has been arrested. And of course, since there, there is no suspect and there is no, no, no arrest, no one has been prosecuted or convicted. And uh, my brother here says the president was very uh, clear. The president has never, ever, has never ever made a statement one way or the other, one way or the other, to condemn this public political assassination on a, on a, on a, a parliamentary leader. A, a Has he ever called you to never. sympathize with you or Not empathize with all. you? Not at all. On the contrary, Mr. Mr. Shaka Sali, it is on record because the speaker wrote to us. Uh, there has been a huge dispute about uh, my treatment. Your treatment? My treatment. Who is paying the bills? They, 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 the parliament of Tanzania should have paid my bills in accordance with our statutory uh, 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 provisions. Yes, and why can't Thus they far, pay? Thus far, they have not paid a penny. And according to the speaker, in parliament, as well as in writing to us, the speaker has said parliament cannot uh, foot the bill for my, my, my medical treatment because, among other things, the president has not given his permission for money to be released for that purpose. What? Now, now, to finish, under our law, the president has no powers whatsoever when it comes to decisions on medical treatment of members of parliament. Now, to the, Lisu, yes. you, you have uh, a country yes. which, by all intents and purposes, 
is functioning very well. Yeah. It has three branches of government. You have the executive led by the president. Mm -hmm. You have the judiciary, which is led by uh, the chief justice. And the independent. You judiciary. have the legislature, which is led by the Honorable. speaker yes. of the National Assembly. Yes. To what extent is the judiciary and the legislature independent of the executive? Or do these arms of government really function in a manner that is subordinate to the executive? Uh, that's a great question, Shaka. And the best answer I can give is to use President Magufuli's own statement uh, uh, on, the, 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 on the matter. The president is on record saying, telling the speaker, and this is televised, that those troublemakers of the opposition in parliament kick them out of parliament so that I will, I will deal with them outside. When they have so no parliamentary kick, kick immunity. Them, no, kick, chuck them out of parliament and I will deal with them outside. I see. And I see. in the past three years, we have been kicked out of parliament on numerable, numerous occasions and the president has dealt with us heavily outside parliament. Using the security forces? S using the security forces. I have been arrested on two occasions outside the, parliam the parliamentary gate. On two occasions I see, I see. for making statements which are absolutely protected under our constitution for making statements inside parliament. I hate to say it, and but... I wait, uh, I, they wait for me outside and... Arrest you. And, and arrest me. And well, on all occasions, in all eight occasions when I was arrested, I'm a lawyer, I would ask them, why are you arresting me? And the answer has always been orders from above. From above. Very interesting. Uh, let me go Can to... I uh, to let, me, let me go to uh, okay. Kampala to Bobby Weiner. Bobby, are you there? I'm there, Shaka. You are listening? You yeah, I'm listening, following very attentively. Does this uh, sound uh, to some degree uh, familiar? Well, that sounds familiar, but uh, living in Kampala, I envy those people. Um, looks like um, it's uh, not only in Uganda, but I would like to speak authoritatively about the situation in Uganda and how we can uh, change it. I believe that uh, all dictators uh, will use the law to uh, oppress the people that they want to oppress and will indeed be, get very uh, threatened when they see people communicating. I'm um, talking more on the freedom of expression. Uh, that is the only thing that people are remained with, remembering that in Uganda and I'm sure other African countries, the uh, internet is being uh, restricted so much and uh, that will remind us that uh, social media tax was introduced in Uganda, and I believe in other countries. Um, there's been continuous um, blockage of communication. There's been continuous attack on the rights of the people, especially communication rights. However, um, we also know that uh, we have opportunities um, to change this. Uh, one of the opportunities is the numbers that we have um, here in Uganda, we are getting people ready to change this because we know we can change it. It will really be unfair for me to talk about the problem and not its solution. I don't know what's happening with our brothers outside there in Africa, but in Uganda we intend to end, to end all this oppression in 2021. That's why we're calling upon all people in Uganda, especially the young people, to be decisive, to get involved in actual, uh, acquiring uh, the change that we've always been looking for, uh, getting involved and uh, coming out to vote against this injustice, against uh, this oppression, and changing our country once and for all. Probably this will be a precedent for the rest of Africa. When you talk about uh, coming out to vote, what exactly are you talking about? Uh, in each of these cases, you are talking about uh, a country, for example, where yeah. the ruling party, for example, is yeah. no different from the state. 
the state and the ruling party are fused? Sure. The state and the ruling party are fused in Uganda. And indeed, it has been said and uh, proved over time that when you come up, uh, against the ruling party, you're coming against the Bank of Uganda, you're coming against the National Army, you're coming against Uganda police and all the institutions. But again, we know that uh, where we are, many countries have been there before. All the countries that we admire today, the countries like Angola, have gone through repression that we are going through. So looking at their history and looking at the factors that we have, which, alt which favor us in all ways, we believe that we're going to be able to change it. So the coming together that I'm talking about is the calling upon all Ugandans. Right now, we are having a campaign called Get Your National ID. We're getting all people in Uganda. And indeed, if other countries in Africa could uh, pick a leaf from what we're doing, they will be able to change their uh, plight. Here in Uganda, we're going to change it in 2021. And indeed, we are putting President Museveni on notice that we are putting an end to the Museveni dictatorship in 2021. I see. John, it looks like uh, here we're talking about uh, situations really where democracy perhaps uh, cannot possibly be defined in the manner that uh, a former great American president, Abraham Lincoln, would have characterized it, which would be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. But that perhaps, in fact, we are looking at a new definition of a government of some people, by some people, for some people. How do you react to that? I think that's true in certain circumstances, and that's where some of the grassroots movements that are resisting that kind of logic are so important. Uh, you look at the recent elections in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, which were quite disappointing, and, and it seems like the outcome is not the legitimate outcome. Uh, but there are remarkable movements, particularly youth movements, who are really pushing against that kind of a logic and trying to move the country towards more legitimate elections. And I think you'll see Honorable Bobby Wine in particular leading that kind of an effort as well. So there is that logic in some countries, and it's not just limited to Africa. Uh, but I think there's strong and really growing resistance to that. That's what we see on the streets of Sudan and Zimbabwe today. Masiringi, Ambassador Masiringi, how do you respond, for example, to someone who will say, that uh, in Tanzania, there are no citizens, but subjects. Citizens meaning owing allegiance to the state and therefore having a constitutional right. But in this particular case, subjects because basically they owe allegiance to an individual authority and therefore in return receive some privileges. The answer is that's absolutely false statement with regard to Tanzania. And uh, my brother Tunduri Suri agree with me. Could you, could you please uh, wrap it up because time is not our best ally. I, I appreciate your time. Tanzania is a democratic, democratically governed country that respects human rights and the rule of law. There well, are citizens, uh, not subjects. Unfortunately, on that note, uh, our guests today were John Tamin, Tundulisu, Ambassador Wilson Masiringi, and Robert Chagulanyi, also known as Bobby Wine, who joined us from Kampala. Thanks to our audience for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.